I baked you a pie. Oh boy, what flavor? Pie flavor. Hello, deep learners. I'm Andrew Ng, founder of DeepLearning.ai, and I'm excited to welcome you to our global deep learning community. I know that many of you are here today because you want to break into AI and build your career. I hope that being part of this community will help you to do so. To give you a proper welcome, I'd like to show you around the DeepLearning.ai offices and meet some of the teams so you can see where it all happens. Oh, hi, Andrew. Do you want to tell our friends at Pine AI what you do at DeepLearning.ai? Sure. Hi, everyone. I, I make articles and other media that help people learn about AI and help them understand the huge impact that AI is having in the world. Today, I'm putting together the next issue of The Batch, our weekly newsletter, and I'm looking for the biggest stories of the week to keep our readers informed. What's been the most surprising thing you've run into working on The Batch? How much is going on in this field? There is never a dull moment. I, you know, you might think from the outside that machine learning engineers really understand everything about AI, but nobody understands everything about AI because this field is just coming to life right before my eyes as I put this thing together every week. All right, I know you're really busy, so I'll let you get back to it. Thanks, see you later. Let's go meet Jian, who helped me create the deep learning specialization. He's working on an exciting new project. Hi, Jian. So do you wanna tell the people at Pine AI what you're working on? Yes, sure. Um, I'm leading a project called Doritera, uh, focusing on helping uh, people get offers uh, in AI and navigating their career by uh, testing their skills, uh, preparing for interviews and certifying them, as well as uh, matching and referring them to good jobs in AI. That's really cool. And what's the most exciting part of your day? You know, the AI field is new, uh, organizations and Jobs are still misunderstood, so I'm excited to help people understand what different types of jobs exist in the field, uh, what tasks do we work on, and what skills are needed to achieve those tasks. That's really important work. Well, it's nice chatting. And now let's go chat to Portel, who is on their product team. Do you want to say hi to our friends at Pi AI and let them know what you're working on? I would love to. Hi everyone. I lead the product team in DeepLearning.ai where we create AI education content accessible to people all around the world. People like you. And what are you most excited about right now? I am so excited to see our community grow and to see how eager people are to learn more about AI. Thanks also. Thanks. So, as you can see, our team is working hard to support you and help you learn. It's never been easier than before to break into AI. So, if you want to build a career, you can leverage online resources available, including open source code, data sets, papers, and online courses like the Deep Learning Specialization on Coursera. As part of this journey, I hope you get your hands dirty too. Don't be afraid of diving in to build your own project. Or go ahead and try to replicate a research paper that you're excited about. One thing that I've seen help a lot of people succeed is if you can build a community or find a community of fellow deep learners you can meet with and study with on a regular basis. In fact, I hope that this Pine AI meetup that you're at right now will be a good place for you to meet these people. I hope you enjoyed the event today and that you learn a lot both from the talks and from each other. And once again, Welcome to the Deep Learning.ai community. Okay, thank you. I hope the audio was good enough. But well, we would usually clap if this was a physical event, but since the pandemic, we've been trying to keep it up and still do the events online. So thank you very much, all of you who came today. We know it's not the same doing it online 
instead of physical, but that's why we record it and we keep track of it, of, of it. So the value that's shared here, it's still available online on our YouTube channel later. And uh, regarding that, just before we start, I would like to tell you about our podcast, which we have in YouTube. This is the first plug, but it's interesting. It's like we, we are, we've already uploaded six episodes where we interview uh, experts from the artificial intelligence field and we try to give um, a, a practical approach and a business-focused approach to what they do in research. So check it out. You can look it up in, in Facebook. I'm sorry, in YouTube. Also, uh, our newsletter. You can subscribe in our in our website here, uh, where we give you like it's kind of like the batch uh, from uh, Deep Learning AI's. Uh, Andrew and G is the batch newsletter, uh, but it's our modest approach to it. We are starting out. And we give it a business focus. So we try to give you the, the, the most interesting news regarding applied artificial intelligence in, in, the, in, in, mar in the markets already. And finally, we've got a Twitter and we're starting out also. So give it a follow if you feel like it. We are a playground. We are just a, a, a new consulting firm with a very different consulting model where we work a lot with freelancers, startups, research centers. We believe in collaborations and in open ecosystems. And that's why we like a lot uh, also education regarding AI. And that's why we partner with uh, Deep Learning AI with, to, to, to uh, make these meetups and try to stimulate a little bit the community around AI. And well, today's, uh, today's topic is super interesting. It's reinforcing, reinforcement learning. And Jorge is a great teacher. He's got experience uh, well, teaching also uh, besides applying this in his work uh, at the IIC, um, he's also a PhD and he's, he's had experience teaching this in, in masters and in academia. So I hope you really enjoy it. And without further ado, I would like to share, give the screen to Jorge. So you can share your screen whenever you want, Jorge. Okay. Thank you. Um... Seems uh, I'm not so uh, confident about uh, my connection because uh, you can see uh, I, uh, so everyone can hear me, right? Okay. Yeah. So as you can see from the video, I'm uh, in this year of lockdowns. I'm also confined in my own house here in the kitchen because there are some. There's some refurbishment going on in the house, so I'm not very <laughs> confident about my uh, uh, connection. So I will um, also uh, disconnect uh, my video if you if you don't mind. Of course, I will I will share my my screen, but uh, I will connect it back when for the the final part when if you want to ask any questions. So let me check if this works. Um, let's share the screen. I just stopped sharing. So I think it will, should be free for you yeah. to share now. Okay, let's see. Also, I'll be I'll be taking a look at the chat. So if you guys have any questions, I will try to queue them and, and forward them to Jorge as they come up. Okay, mm -hmm. so feel free to ask anything in the chat of the of the Zoom meeting. Okay, so can you confirm that you're seeing yeah, my we're, screen? Yeah, we are, we have visuals from your screen. Okay, okay. Looking good. So, uh, well, this is the title of this talk. I'm going to try to, uh, as Sanju said, uh, AI is getting a uh, huge field, so it's really difficult even for us experts to keep on updated on, uh, on all topics. So one of the hot topics lately is um, uh, reinforcement learning. So I'm gonna to try to explain to you in like 40, 45 minutes uh, why it is a hot topic now and what it is being used for. Uh, so why it is also a very promising field of uh, research and work in the forthcoming years. So first, why reinforcement learning um, instead of some other AI topics? Well, uh, Reinforcement learning, uh, it became um, uh, 
useful first in the robotics field first to do some uh, really like simple jobs like a job a robot automatically follow a, a line such as like you can see here uh, so very basic movements and tracking but now it has evolved into quite sophisticated tasks some of which you are probably taking advantage at your homes right now for example these Roombas or uh, vacuum cleaners, automatic vacuum cleaners. If you have ever wondered how they can manage to uh, learn uh, how our uh, house looks like and not bump or at least not bump too much into walls and gradually uh, do it better, it is basically what is uh, uh, under the hood is uh, reinforcement learning techniques. Also, uh, they're implemented in quite a lot of drones. So, and also, of course, much more sophisticated domains such as uh, explosive handling. You know, probably you've heard about all those robots that uh, uh, try to deactivate bombs or. Uh, go into radioactive zones or undersea um, in really dangerous environments for humans so uh, this is one uh, another domain where reinforcement learning is really important but now it has concentrated uh, it has caught media attention especially because it has been really successful in games so uh, classical games such as chess or Go, and also video games. First, also in basic video games such as this uh, one from the uh, um, when we were really young, like Pong or uh, Space Invaders, those classical arcades, you know, in the 80s. Uh, so it all started here, but now it is really competitive or even more than competitive, better than humans, also in really complex games such as poker and video games like uh, really popular ones such as League of Legends, Starcraft, Dota. Of course, this also has applications in simulators and video game AIs. But this is the field where uh, uh, now it is being more uh, used and there is more uh, uh, attention, especially because of these two companies. First, it was DeepMind, the one that uh, became really popular when uh, they uh, came up with a paper where they showed that they could outperform humans in most of these classical Atari games. And then it was acquired, uh, it was bought by Google. And also OpenAI, which uh, belongs to, uh, you know, to Elon Musk uh, universe, like uh, Tesla and SpaceX. So OpenAI is his company devoted to uh, artificial intelligence. And they are also, uh, pioneers in this application to uh, video games. So uh, this is the current situation, but it is starting to uh, also be explored and is quite promising in regarding autonomous driving. So uh, it's just starting first with simulators and driving simulators or video games such as the one that you see here on top uh, but soon the idea is implementing all these and to trying to improve uh, autopilots like in uh, teslas or other uh, car brands in partnership with nvidia and some other some other hardware uh, providers of course this is not just this complex domain of self-driving, it is not just uh, reinforcement learning, the 
only technique it is used uh, together with many other uh, ai uh, techniques such as computer vision and, and deep learning uh, and of course this is not just for uh, cars but also uh, it can be really useful for automatic delivery or public services such as uh, metro or buses being uh, driven automatically so my idea here is is to try in this uh, short time to give you our uh, grasp on how this can all be done uh, of course we are not going to delve too much into the into the technical details but i will try to keep it simple yet rigorous at the same time so uh, my goal is that you can uh, see how we can go from this really basic initial idea to uh, how we can apply it currently to video games and give a hint on how it can be used in the near future uh, in yet more complex domains such as um, self-driving okay so let's go for it and uh, revise the basic concepts of uh, reinforcement learning so uh, reinforcement learning is all about uh, agents interacting with environments so uh, we can understand the environment as the problem that the agent is interacting with and it is interacting uh, in a continuous way uh, depicted in this loop so the environment is like the problem and the agent is the learner or um, let's say the player or the uh, robot in if it's cleaning our house or the car if it's learning how to uh, drive that interacts with the environment and tries to succeed or to learn from it okay so for example if uh, if the agent is the Roomba, the cleaner in our house, then the environment is our house itself. If the agent is the player or the artificial intelligence player playing chess, for instance, then the environment is the chessboard. And uh, if it's a car, then the environment, it's the road, the streets, the whole city that it has to uh, drive along okay so that is the idea and how is this interaction taking place well it's uh, it's all about time so at a given moment the agent uh, selects an action to do then sends this action to the environment and then the environment as a result sends uh, the agent uh, the estate in which it is currently together with a reward. So let's try to uh, clarify this. So what is a state? The state is the representation of the environment from the agent's point of view, right? So it is how the agent sees the environment. So for uh, keeping on with the same example as before, um, the uh, cleaner uh, it's the state is how it represents internally our house okay to try to uh, clean it as uh, quickly and as fine as possible so what actions can it uh, perform with that environment well uh, the cleaner can move forward move backwards move right move left and uh, try to clean try to mop mm, several stuff but the action uh, it's what the agent does okay so uh, it is um, this continuous loop what makes it possible so 
the we have the agent uh, looking at the environment representing it with states then deciding on what to do so okay the state is this so i should take this action then it performs the action and as a result the environment goes to a new state this is represented by the t plus one so this means that at the next moment in time the uh, environment is going to send a new state and a reward that is going to tell the agent how well or how wrong it is performing at the moment okay and this cycle continues on and on uh, so this is what i just mentioned the reward is uh, the environment telling the agent okay you're doing fine or mm, mm, not so not so good so what is the goal of the agent here so uh, what we are gonna try to do is that the agent shows intelligence what does that mean it means that it wants to maximize the reward it gets through time so in more mathematical terms that means to maximize its expected cumul cumulative uh, reward but what it means in plain language is try to uh, get the biggest uh, sum of rewards through time as possible. This is quite different from uh, classical machine learning because uh, if you're familiar with machine learning, we do not have rewards there. We have uh, specific labels and what a machine learning model tries to do is to uh, mimic all those uh, labels for the patterns that it is shown but um, for a specific data set but here there is not really a data set it's just the agent interactive interacting in a continuous way with the environment uh, getting either good or bad results that's what the reward is telling and as a result trying to gradually refine its actions so that rewards get bigger and bigger over time okay uh, so uh, what it is actually trying to maximize is the uh, reward it gets as i said summing it over time uh, of course there's a problem with this that if this is a never-ending loop so if this is an infinite loop it keeps on interacting forever then this sum in theory it would be infinite so how do we do that uh, it is not uh, infinite well there is this discount factor gamma here so that expresses whether we the agent is going to try to obtain uh, rewards uh, now as soon as possible or it is acting more on a uh, far-sighted way so trying to maximize them in the long term you can also uh, another ex another example in real life so to try to make this cl more clear is uh, when uh, in finance you try to decide in what stocks you're gonna invest so depending on how aggressive an investor you are probably you will decide to invest in some stocks or in others depending on whether you want immediate uh, uh, returns so you want immediate profit or you're more conservative and uh, you really want of course you want profit you do not want to lose your money you want to earn as much money as possible but maybe you do not want to earn that money in a few months but in a matter of years so uh, if you want to earn in a matter of years probably you will uh, invest in lower risk um, stocks or options 
Um, but if you want to earn a, a lot of money in the short term, you will have to take more risks. So exactly that is uh, what this discount factor is trying to model. So uh, whether the agent tries to maximize rewards immediately, so this is like the broker trying to uh, get a lot of money uh, now or in a few weeks or in a few months, but definitely not years. But if this is uh, if this is close to one, then the agent cares more about long-term results and not so much about short-term ones. Okay, so but let's uh, stick to the idea that uh, we can uh, decide uh, uh, whether we want long-term or short-term. But in either case, what we want is to get. Uh, rewards as uh, big as possible and that the uh, sum over time of these rewards is also as large as possible okay so that's what the agent is going to try to do um, how it is going to try to do that of course selecting the best action so that uh, that's possible uh, this is term the policy in reinforcement learning. What we mean by policy is how uh, it selects an action basing on the current state that the environment is sending it. So uh, uh, in order also to allow for probabilities, uh, this policy pie, what we mean by this uh, symbol here is what is the probability of choosing action A, given that the current state is S? Um, in order to do that, uh, we're gonna use two auxiliary functions. One is the value function that is gonna tell us how good, how promising or how bad a current uh, state is. So this is the expected return that we are gonna obtain if we keep on following policy pi from this state, okay? Whereas the Q function is how good or bad is a pair of state and an action. So given that we are in state S and that we're gonna choose now action A, what is our expected return from now on, okay? So again, in plain language, and the value function is going to tell us how good or bad a state is, whereas the Q function is going to tell us how good or bad uh, a state together with an action is, right? So th those are the basic uh, concepts. So let's try to illustrate them on a very basic example. So here we have this really simple maze so we have this start and, and of course we're gonna uh, we want to get to the goal here what is the state uh, and the agent of course is gonna try to find the goal starting from here uh, and its actions are gonna move right down left or right so what is the state? The state is the location in this maze. So basically in what square we are at the moment. Okay, so this is the state where we are. The actions is how to move, uh, in what direction. And the policy is represented here by the arrow. So th remember that the policy is what action do we take on each state? So because the states are the squares and the actions are the directions, then the policy is represented by these arrows here. Uh, if you notice how these arrows are placed, uh, this has been solved already. So these are the arrows indicating how to move if you want to get as quickly as possible from, the, uh, from whichever square to the goal. So for example, if we are start here, then first we should move right, then upwards, then all this right. Okay, so 
if we keep following the arrows, we'll eventually get to the goal. How do we arri arrive to this policy? Um, well, if we have a reward of minus one for each time step that passes, this means that the agent is receiving a negative feedback for each time that passes without uh, reaching the goal. So what is uh, gonna, uh, what is the agent gonna try to do? Well, if I get like a sort of punishment, so for each time uh, that I do not reach the goal, then I will try to get to the goal as quickly as possible. So with a little bit of thought, uh, you will realize that the value function then what it means is uh, it's negated, negating how many squares uh, are we here, for example, minus 12 means that we are 12 squares away from the goal. Okay, so the larger uh, as uh, the value is in a given state, it means that the state is better. So which are the which is the best state here, the one that is next to the goal, of course, because we are just one square away from it. And here it gets more and more negative the more away, we, the further away we are from the goal. Okay, so this is how uh, the agent eventually realizes that it has to do this if he, if he wants to get to the goal as quickly as possible. If you think about it, this maze, of course, is really simple, but what uh, the Roomba is doing in our houses is not so different from this. Uh, basically, the, uh, that robot is going to try to map our rooms to create a map with them and learn where the obstacles are. So the obstacles, the pieces of furniture, and the doors and everything, these, those are like the black squares here and the white squares are uh, the corridors and the rooms that it wants to clean. So uh, the goal is not exactly the same because it, it wants to clean everything and as thoroughly as possible. But when it runs out of battery, what it what it's gonna try to do is to return as quickly as possible to the battery station. So uh, of course, uh, you can grasp that it is a bit more elaborate than this, but not so different afterwards. Okay, so this shows us how these concepts can be uh, applied in, in real life, but let's try to also have an intuition on the techniques that are uh, that allow us to uh, do this in quickly in and intelligently so uh, we're gonna stick for the moment with really uh, simple environments where the actions that we can take are limited like in the maze we can just move in the four directions but that's all and also environments where the states are limited. So, uh, for example, the squares here are also limited because there are just like 25 of them. And if also the rewards are limited, then what, and the time is finite, what we can do is to run many episodes and, and see what happens. So. Uh, because of the loop that we defined before, this continuous loop, uh, an episode in reinforcement learning is, uh, uh, is de described by a trajectory that means, okay, I start in this state, then I choose an action, then I get a reward, then as a result there is a new state, from which I select another action and then I get another reward and then I get to next state, blah, 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 till eventually I 
reach the end of the episode or there is an event, for example, reaching the goal here that stops everything because uh, uh, I already finished, okay? So I'm gonna to collect basically uh, all of these state, action, reward, state, action, reward, state, action, reward in an iterative way. Um, if we have full, really full knowledge in an ideal case, we, we know all states, all actions, all rewards, and if we also know the all probabilities from transitioning from one to another, this is represented by this transition matrix. Do not worry too much, uh, too much about the notation. And if Markov property holds, that means it doesn't really matter what did I, what I did in the past. So the future is gonna depend only on where I where I am now, not on how did I arrive to this point. So, for example, if I'm here in uh, this state, I do not Markov property says I do not worry about how did I reach this state. Okay, I do not care whether I went through T minus one or just five or three states here. What it only matters is that currently I am in this state. And the future is just gonna depend on this state on what I do now, okay? If this holds and we have full knowledge of all these possible states, actions and rewards, then uh, it is possible to calculate explicitly uh, through Bellman's equations. Uh, again, uh, don't worry too much about the formulas, just the intuitive idea is that how good or bad is a state? Well, uh, uh, what do we have to do to know if a state is good or bad? Well, we have to uh, consider all possible actions that I can take from that state and where those actions take me. So, uh, because we have also this Q function telling me, okay, if you select action one, then this is how good or bad it is. And if you select action two, then this is how good or bad it was. Uh, if we do that for all actions that we can take, then we can know whether a state is good or bad. Again, to illustrate this with a more simple example, consider that you are playing chess, for instance. And if you want to evaluate the state is the current state of the board, so where you have the, your pieces and the opponent's pieces. So if you want to evaluate whether you are in a good situation or bad, um, what you are uh, trying to do is, okay, so from this state, I could move this pawn forward, or maybe I could move this knight, or maybe I could move this rook. And if I did that, then I would reach this other state, and imagine that you know already beforehand how good or bad that new position is, okay? Then it is clear that uh, if from the current state you can select an action that drives you to a really good state in the sense that it is very likely that you will win, of course, you will uh, infer two things. One, that that state is very good and two, that the, that action is the one that you should take. Ideally, if you can take one action that guarantees you a checkmate, then you should take that one and your position, your state was a really good one because you can select, uh, you can move a piece in a way that uh, checkmates your opponent, okay? Uh, the same idea can be uh, exploited from uh, the pairs of states and actions. So 
how good or bad is an action select, selected at a given state? Well, we have to see how that, uh, where that action uh, uh, takes us and it takes us to another state. We are in our current state, we have selected an action and that takes to another state. So uh, if those states in turn are good, then this action was very convenient at this state. And if the states that we are going to are not very good ones, it wasn't a really good choice. What is key here is that the V depends on the Qs and that the Qs depend on the Vs. So all this is recursive and we can exploit this structure to try to calculate uh, all stuff. So uh, without, again, without going too much into the details, just plain language, what is the best action that we can take uh, in a in given state? Well, we should take the action that takes us with greatest probability to the best state uh, from that moment on. Seeing it from the other point of view, if we are in a current state, what is the action that we should take? Well, we should take the action that takes us to the most promising state with, again, with the highest probability. So uh, that is what we should do. If we are able to calculate all the cues, this gets really simple because what is the action that we should take in a given state, well, just take the action that uh, with maximal Q, because that means that it is the action that takes you with the largest probability to a best uh, state. So if you want to win, you want to, uh, of course, you want to get to a good state. And if there is an action that takes you uh, to a, one of those states, with more probability than other actions, then you should always take that one. Okay, so that sounds very simple, but as this uh, caption tells us, it is not so simple. So how can we actually calculate this magical Q function that is gonna tell me for each state and for each action that I can take in each state? whether that's good or bad. Should we apply brute force to that? No, that is not very, uh, that is only possible for very, very simple scenarios. But if you, if we go back to chess, this is not possible because there are many possible configurations of the board. And if you think about it, given a configuration of the board, uh, you can also move different pieces, and there are some pieces that you can move in, uh, in one way or another. So it is not only deciding which piece to move, but also where exactly to move it. And we, could, we cannot do that with pure brute force. So we need something more intelligent than that. Uh, but because of the recursions that we have seen before, uh, let me at least give you the intuition why this can work. So we start with some arbitrary policy. This can basically be random. So we start knowing nothing about the environment. We just try random actions. So we do not know yet how to play uh, well chess and we are going to select uh, really poor actions, but gradually we are going to uh, find out that there are some very, uh, there are some choices that are really, really poor and some others that are much better. So once we tr uh, gradually start learning that, then we change our policy. So instead of being random, if we see that uh, there are some really stupid things to do. We are gonna learn uh, little by little not to do them. So we are gonna avoid all those 
crappy actions and instead select ones that are better. And then we are going to explore new states as a result. And gradually all these, uh, little by little, converges to the optimal uh, to the optimal policy. So this means that little by little, if you uh, can explore absolutely everything and if you know all possible outcomes, you can become a master of whichever game, even if you uh, start knowing nothing. But the problem with this is that, uh, of course, this is better than brute force, but it is too slow. And moreover, it requires knowing absolutely all probabilities. And we do not know. Uh, there are very few environments in practice where we know all this uh, from the beginning. So, OK, this is something to take into account, but uh, we're going to need better techniques if we're going to uh, exploit this in more complex scenarios. So another idea is to use uh, this episodic uh, nature of reinforcement learning and try directly to uh, uh, run many, many, many episodes, even if they finish with uh, us most of the times losing in our game. And uh, because, you know, because uh, computers can simulate really, really quickly uh, and, and calculate things uh, much more quickly than us, uh, we can do that uh, even if uh, we, um, as human beings, we cannot play Tetris millions of times, even if even if we uh, were uh, really obsessed about uh, some video game, we cannot uh, play it millions of times, but computers certainly can. So they can try many, 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 many times without uh, ruining themselves. Because if you remember from those old arcade games, we had to in that ominous message telling us insert coin, uh, if we didn't want to spend all our money on that um, that video game, there was a moment where we could not play anymore. When we had spent all our money in it, we could not play anymore. But computers can emulate a video game over and over and over again and try to learn by this idea of running many episodes and seeing what happens. Uh, which, again, which states are better, which actions are really poor, uh, to try to gradually learn from this experience. If we combine these two ideas, first trying to uh, update uh, the value functions so that we get uh, uh, we calculate which states are best and which are worst. If we combine this with the episodic uh, nature of reinforcement learning, we can do even better than this become, because we do not need the episode to finish. Again, if you uh, think of a video game, uh, of course, when uh, we had this message of game over, we learned that we had done something wrong. But uh, in the meantime, we were also learning some things. So perhaps uh, we didn't have yet this message of game over. But when we were playing, we were we were also realizing that there were some things that we were doing fine, but there were some other things that we were doing really wrong. So uh, if we can use a technique that while it is playing, it can also learn not just when an episode finishes. So it is not uh, just uh, playing chess and losing many times and then inferring what did you do wrong but trying to learn while you are playing. 
not just when the game finishes, but also when you are playing. So this is what I mean here by concrete on the fly. So um, we can do that if we combine these two techniques, we can uh, keep, uh, keep the best of both worlds. So it is to try to um, keep the spirit of Bellman's equations, so try to update one state from the next one, and at the same time, trying to keep the Monte Carlo idea of uh, using expected return to update the uh, value of this state. Okay, so if we combine all these two things and we apply this same idea not to the V function but to the Q function, then uh, we are just one step away to reaching Q learning, which is uh, like the core algorithm in reinforcement learning. Many, many, probably all introductory lessons that you can uh, find in internet regarding reinforcement learning, you will see that uh, they all refer to this Q learning stuff. So what does Q learning uh, mean? It means just to uh, learn this uh, Q function on the fly uh, trying to explore first the most promising actions. So trying to select the actions. This max here is the action that, at least for the moment, is taking us to the best next state. Okay. And uh, the good thing about this is that, as I said, episodes are not required to finish, but there are still some problems here one is the, that we need, in order to really find the best possible course of action, we need to explore absolutely all states and actions. And what happens then if we have too many of those, uh, of those states? Or what if actions are too many? So is this still possible? Well, uh, let's assume for the moment that it is. So. This is the uh, pseudocode of uh, cube learning. So uh, the idea is what we have outlined. Okay, don't worry about the minor details. So the idea is that we are going to run many episodes. So this loop here is run one episode, then run one, then run another, then run another, etc. Till when? Till we are we have converged to uh, the uh, to the q values of each state and action pair okay updating always with this equation that we had here okay so the problem with this is of course that we are gonna uh, we want to learn this q for all states and for all actions so Okay, this is very good if we manage to do that, but uh, how can we do that if there are many, many, many possible states? Okay, so uh, let's think about games a bit more to try how this uh, uh, framework can help us in playing uh, games better. So, uh, Games and classical board games such as chess or also uh, video games such as Tetris or Mario Bros or Sonic or nearly every, every video game, uh, they are very suited to this sort of interaction because uh, all games have a very well-defined rules. In some, there is some a bit of a random component. So there are some games where you roll a dice or uh, where you're playing with cards, where uh, there is a random component of which cards you get or what number comes out of the die of the dice. But uh, the rules are very well defined. And games, if you think about them, are episodic 
by nature because a game finishes uh, typically in two ways either you win or either you lose there is there are also some games like chess where you can tie or where there can be a draw but typically either you win or you lose so for example here in the tetris we lost here because there is this uh, game over that we did never want to see that uh, so because of this also rewards are very clear what do you want so what are you trying to accomplish what is a, an intelligent player gonna do try to win as much as possible and try to lose uh, as few as few games as possible and if you think also about actions they are typically also very very limited in chess okay there are quite a lot of pieces and but uh, it's you can just play with 16 pieces and in tetris you can you could only uh, move uh, left right and rotate the rotate the piece and that's all because gravity uh, pushed uh, the piece downwards so uh, it is very very suited to reinforcement learning because uh, we can run episodes so we can basically try out stuff and see whether we win or we lose there is also a predefined set of rules so this makes very easy that we can simulate uh, episodes because we can program these rules and uh, so that the computer can try many many combinations and see uh, if that eventually goes to a win or to a lose and reward is obvious we want to win and we do not want to lose so uh, okay so that's great news but there are also difficulties if you think about games there are some games where it is not possible to have full knowledge of what's going on even if you have a super powerful computer and you can uh, compute all this stuff all states all actions even so uh, you can just know your situation but you you do not know, for example, if you are playing poker, the game is really about uh, figuring out what the others have, but you, are, you do not know for sure. So even if you have uh, are very good at calculating, there are some games where you can only have partial knowledge. You do not know what is going on uh, totally in chess you can because uh, you know what where pieces are and you know where the opponent pieces are there is nothing hidden there but in poker and some typically in card games you do not know that, that. Uh, even if actions are restricted there are also some games where mm, there are quite a lot of possible actions in chess is quite difficult to master because there are many choices of what to do in a given moment and there are other games such as go where there is typically in go you can choose up to 200 different actions in a given moment so that makes it really difficult to decide it is not uh, difficult to select uh, if you only have four actions at your disposal but if you have 200 it is much more difficult to select the best one of 200 than the best one of four but the biggest problem in video games is that uh, the number of states can be really really huge so uh, uh, even in more classical games such as chess the number of possible configurations of the board is huge it's really um, a huge number and you cannot mm, consider them all let alone a video game which is even more complex because it is not just a board with some pieces on but it is a more complex stuff 
with a screen that is moving and a character and some enemies appearing. So how can we infer um, if we are doing right or wrong in something which is uh, dynamic? Okay, like uh, this, we're playing here Mario Bros, which is, was a quite simple video game, but even so, we had bricks, we had enemies, we had, uh, we tried to collect as many coins as possible, so we had to take quite a lot of things into account. So how can we uh, do that uh, in this scenario? So, okay, we have the key idea, so the key idea is the same. We have to uh, learn this Q function. So given a state and an action, we want to try to learn whether that's good or bad, ideally for all possibilities. But because uh, there are many possible states, it is not possible to build any more a comprehensive table of all state action pairs. So we have to forget about this, not a table anymore, but here is where neural networks or especially deep networks come to the rescue because instead of trying to build a huge table with all possibilities, what we are gonna do is make the network, given a state, it is the network itself that is gonna approximate uh, for all possible actions, you know, actions are much more limited than states. So states in a chessboard are all possible configurations, but actions are just what we can do with pieces and that's much more limited. Um, also with Mario, if you think we could move right, we could move left and we could jump but that's typically three, four, five things, and that's all. But the number of screens is huge. So what we're going to do is that the network is going to estimate for all possible actions, given a state, how good or bad each action is. And why, net, why neural networks and not any other machine learning models? Well, first, because they are universal approximators. So it doesn't matter how complex this Q function is, given enough examples, we could approximate virtually everything. And also uh, because in the video game world, uh, they are very well, uh, the, uh, they are very uh, suited to image analysis. So especially convolutional networks, so they can extract knowledge from images. So for example, they can infer that this is an enemy and this is a block and this is a score, okay? So uh, they're gonna be very convenient for trying to infer things from images. And they are also now very powerful libraries and uh, tools to exploit them. So this is how they have been used very successfully in this field. Uh, just to outline how does, does that work, of course, this is much more advanced stuff, so we are just going to sketch it. Uh, the idea is that in deep reinforcement learning, we're going to use a deep network to do this. So we feed it with frames of the video game that we're going to try to play. Why? Uh, different frames and not just a static image because in many video games we need also to know not just uh, how our uh, character is at the moment but whether it's moving left or it's moving right and in order to know that it is not enough with just one static image but with uh, images that are one after the other, so typically the frames of the of the video game. And then it receives that uh, those images of the video game and then it uh, infers what is the action that is going to be the best for that situation. 
and how do we how do we train those networks to learn that well exploiting all that we have mentioned so it is running many many episodes to collect many evidence about stay okay if we are in this state and we take this action then this happens if if instead of that you do this other thing then we will get to this other state so by collecting many 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 of those evidences by playing millions of times if necessary the games then they can change their weights their internal weights gradually so that uh, they reproduce that behavior and gradually select the actions that performs best for its possible state uh, the technique behind that is uh, by propagating the error function of the gradient okay but this is based on uh, the q function that we have learned a few slides ago so if we exploit all this together then the result is uh, dqn this stands for deep q network so um, here we have all concepts in the name because we have a network that means a network that is q so that means it is learning the q function and it is doing that in a deep way so it is using a deep uh, neural network to extract features from uh, video game images and then by playing many many times and doing it typically at the beginning really really wrong gradually selecting the best actions so that in the end as you as it was published in this nature paper they can be better than humans if you realize how they are playing this video probably you will never get so good uh, with it as uh, the network eventually does if you think that it is playing millions of times probably if you lived thousands of years and you could play also millions of times you will you would get as good but because we cannot do that unfortunately then uh, they are better than us so that is for classical video games and this was like this was like the breakthrough a few years ago but now it is getting even more and more impressive probably you have heard about AlphaGo you have a documentary in Netflix if you are curious about it so this is uh, a reinforcement learning algorithm developed by DeepMind at Google that beat the world champion of Go, that was a South Korean guy. And this was a breakthrough in artificial intelligence because it was believed that uh, chess after, if you remember, after Deep Blue and IBM, uh, it was considered that uh, computers already played better than humans, but Go was another uh, subject because there are so many movements possible that by classical artificial intelligence techniques they were just amateurs but via reinforcement learning uh, Google developed this AlphaGo algorithm that uh, beat the world champion in in such a way that he uh, he himself uh, it, he quit because said that this artificial intelligence cannot be defeated. Uh, that was DeepMind and OpenAI, that is the other um, top company in this. Uh, they have this uh, player of Dota, which has beat not all, but nearly all uh, e-games experts. So 99.4% of players that try to uh, play against this reinforcement learning algorithm they lose and you could you can all, all, always think yes but those are games where you know those are like classical games what about games with random components and bluffing like uh, poker well 
they are getting better and better. So and now even poker champions are at danger because there are, there are some algorithms coming out that they can beat professional poker games um, players, uh, at least in uh, Texas Hold'em, I think it, it was. Still not, uh, still not so competitive or so dominant as in Go or uh, esports, but probably this will be the next uh, milestone to to reach. Okay, so well, that was that was it. And if you are more curious about all this stuff, which uh, of course is uh, much deeper than just outlined here, but I hope that with this uh, introduction, you got the idea of how this can be all exploited to not just play video games. Once you, uh, once you can uh, extract features from images and show, and show intelligent behavior, we are not so far from applying that to uh, autonomous driving. Of course, driving is not so simple as a game. Um, if we do wrong, there are real casualties. It's not just in a video game that someone gets killed, but gets killed in real life. So we have to be much more careful with that. But uh, we are making progress and uh, it is certainly possible that in the coming years, uh, nearly all our uh, vehicles uh, exploit all these techniques to drive and probably drive even better than we do the same way than that they are already playing games much better than we do so if we if you want to keep on with uh, uh, looking at this uh, very interesting field. I recommend this uh, book, which is like the Bible of Reinforcement Learning, the book by Sutton and Barton. You have here the link, it's free of charge. And I also suggest to follow people at uh, DeepMind and OpenAI, the, uh, especially their heads of uh, AI, which are David Silver, Denis Hassadis and at DeepMind and Ilya Sutskever at OpenAI. And also Peter Abel is a very top guy if you are interested in taking courses or because he teaches at Berkeley. And of course, if we if you are not just interested in reinforcement learning, but also on deep reinforcement learning. Well, I recommend that uh, you take the deep learning specialization of, of course, at deep learning AI. And then you can uh, try by yourselves uh, all this stuff and, and probably ev eventually uh, uh, succeed at that old video game that you did not manage to. <laughs> to reach the final boss when, when, when you played it, when, when you were kids or probably when you're still playing video games. So you can try your informal learning methods there to see if, if, if you see the end of the video. Okay, so that's all for what I wanted to, to say. So now if you have some questions, I will be happy to answer them. Let me stop the presentation. Thank you very so, much. I would I would be clapping, but I, I just sent a reflection. I just in the chat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess. I'm hearing myself twice. I'm hearing myself uh, twice. Do you do you hear me twice too? Do you do you hear me twice too? Mm. Let's, let me disconnect my microphone for a moment. Ah, maybe it was that. Maybe it was ah, that. Maybe it was that. Maybe it was that. Yeah, now no, I'm listening again. Yeah, no, no. yeah so if, if nobody has any questions, I have one if for you. Has any questions, I have one for you. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Which are the main limitations as of today for this technology to the, the, the algorithm to rule them all?
yeah the the limitation is that uh, the main limitation of this is that even if we have these top-notch libraries uh, and these uh, networks that we can exploit if you wonder why it is just google and open ai that are the top companies it is because uh, uh, for example open ai when we they want to train this uh, dota player they played millions and millions of games with a cluster of like 200 supercomputers so of course you cannot do that by yourself only these top companies can uh, have the resources to do that but uh, uh, i have myself uh, programmed um, some uh, reinforcement learning basic technique and for example with a super nintendo game after a few hours or after a few days you can reach a quite competitive agent so it is not science fiction you can do it by yourself of course if you can if you want to apply this for a really complex problem such as uh, Tesla with the uh, self-driving car, you need simulation resources. You need many, many computers simulating all this uh, uh, for a, quite a long period of time so that eventually uh, they learn. It is not something that you can do with your laptop, but uh, there is a very active research community in this field, so uh, progress is really quick, is really fast, as you can, as you can see. It was this paper in Nature playing Atari. It was in 2015, I think, and in just five years, we have jumped from those simple games like Tetris and Space Invaders to world uh, to starcraft and much more complex video games so you know in artificial intelligence things keep on progressing really really quickly so that's why we have so many webinars and <laughs> so many events of this because uh, it is really really difficult to uh, keep updated so probably soon we will be able to uh, do things that for now they can only be done by these top companies but you can awesome. always uh, learn artificial wow. intelligence and work in one of those companies so. great great so maybe learning learning all this can be your passport to a, uh, to a career in, in artificial intelligence right Yeah, definitely. Um, I I know that in in DeepMind and in OpenAI, they are always interested in hiring uh, researchers. Actually, universities now have a real problem because their top AI researchers are <laughs> gradually being absorbed by Facebook, Google, uh, OpenAI, Amazon. And so if you, um, if you are studying or either at university or by yourself on Coursera or by self-teaching in this field, uh, it is quite likely that you get hired by one of those super companies and you work in really this very interesting uh, project. I think it That's is, great. it would be I would, really, I would really like nice to... To work oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just saying that we would like to sponsor a little bit of, of that. Uh, so uh, we're going to make a quiz right now. I'm going to send the link in the chat. And there's a prize for the winner, um, which is a, a, we usually give a, a coupon in Amazon. But this time, I think it's, it's, it would be uh, very poetic to, to send a, a physical copy of the book you recommended. Uh, to the winner 
So that's going to be the prize uh, of the quiz today. Uh, the book that Jorge just recommended us about reinforcement learning, a hardcover copy of that book for the winner of the of the quiz. Let me share the screen here. We've got already two two players who have joined the quiz. And let's wait a little bit. It's just three questions. So be fast and be right. That's what you what you need to do. And they're all about the the talk. Jorge has prepared the, the three questions. Um, I think you can see my screen already, right? We've got Danny, we've got Juan Pablo Gonzalez and ML, three participants. So for the rest of you, uh, if you have any problems signing in to the quiz, just let me know. You just need to go to joinmyquiz.com and enter the code 444791. I just share the link in the chat in the video. Okay. Yeah. And don't worry because there is no reinforcement le learning agent playing this. No, you can always. Yeah. There, there's oh, there's four here. There's how many people? Let me check of the participants. Yeah, it's nine participants in the in the room. Uh, less, I mean seven because obviously Jorge and I are not going to to participate. So we would hope for seven people if seven people want to join and. And play and maybe join the copy of the of the reinforcement learning book, which five. If anybody is still trying to join and has any problems, just let me know. Either you can unmute yourselves and talk, or or else uh, text in the chat. So the wise we will start the quiz right now. Oh, Danny says thanks a lot. Oh, thank you, Danny. Thanks a lot. Sure. Yeah. Well, we'll come with you for the next ones. Um, just for you to know that if you just uh, subscribe to the Eventbrite of Pi and AI events, you will get notifications whenever an event comes up, either ours or for or, or an event organized by, by any of the other Pi and AI ambassadors all around the world. And as as of today, all of them are being mostly online. You can uh, you can join any any of them. Okay, so let's start. There's five participants here. Are you ready? Let's go. First question here. Yeah, we even, we even have cool music. What else can I do? Okay, which was the field where reinforcement learning first showed its potential? We've got the questions all done. Let's see. This was at the beginning of the of the talk. And ML is in, on the letterboard because the rest of you got it wrong. He was the only one to get a right answer. It was robotics, which was the beginning of the at the beginning of the talk. Jorge, but don't worry, you can you can still earn some points here. What is the reasoning behind classical reinforcement learning algorithms? Is it using neural networks to speed up calculations, compete in the best states, using brute force to explore every combination of states, or descending on the gradient of the reward function? Tick tac, tick tac. Twelve seconds. Yes, we have some time left. <laughs> Come on, make your choice. There you go. There's still one left. Two seconds. Ooh, I love the, I love the thrill of the of the timer. Ooh, Juan Pablo. We've got we've got here ML and Juan Pablo following closely each other. So the right question was computing the best states and actions, exploiting recursion, as we learned today. And then for the final question, this is a very quick round. Get ready. Why have neural networks contributed to the expansion of reinforcement learning? Is it because they allow to apply reinforcement learning to continuous environments? Maybe convolution ones are specially tailored to extract features from images. They exploit gradient descent and our acceleration techniques with ad hoc libraries or all of the above. This is one of those. The one that you have, <laughs> that, that kind of option. <laughs> There's just one player. Missing two seconds and time. Okay, all done. Let's see the final letterboard. For us of right now, I think we've got some movements here, but Juan Pablo kept the lead. So we've got uh, the results here, and the winner of the quiz for today. Well, third place, we've got Dela Retio, Emel, and Juan Pablo Gonzalez. 
Thank you very much and congratulations, Juan Pablo. Thanks also to all of you guys for participating. Participating. Don't worry, I won't. I will not send an email to your to your parents here. <laughs> so just in case, you know. And and well, uh, Juan Pablo, I will I will send you a, an email, okay, with the with the um, with the information I need. I will need your address so I can uh, we can send you the copy of the book. And for the rest of you, I wish you the best of luck on the next one. And we've got another one on December. Um, I will be actually giving that one myself. It's about uh, GANs and how with AI we can create realistic pictures, videos, and we can make fakes and how this affects the world. We will make a very easy example of that. And we also have a prize for the winner. So that's all for today. Thank you very much for joining. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at Playground, to the Even Bright page to stay up to date and not miss the following one. We do it every third Wednesday of the month. We do a Pi and AI uh, by us, by Playground uh, online. And then we will also do it again on physical as soon as that's possible in Madrid, the capital of Spain. So that's all. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Jorge, for joining. It was very, very interesting. I loved it. I hope to see you on the next events. And keep an eye on AI until then. And stay awesome. Bye. Thank you. Push yourself, push yourself, take it.